Let's give a, a round of applause to our keynote speaker, Ryan Holiday, best-selling author of The Obstacle is the Way and of a lot of other books. He's going to talk about his journey through Stoicism. Oh, yeah. I need this. Thank you. Um, well, first off, it's an honor to be here, um, especially to be speaking after uh, a group of speakers, almost all of whom uh, I have read their books and sort of never thought I would be speaking after them. It's a, it's a huge honor. Um, I assume before I get into that, uh, am I loud enough? Louder? All right, cool. Uh, so I will start with uh, the question that many of you are probably asking, which is, uh, who the hell is this guy? Um, I was 19 years old. Uh, I dropped out of college, uh, and I apprenticed under a writer. His name is Robert Greene. Um, he's the author of a book called The 48 Laws of Power. I was fortunate enough to be his research assistant on a book he was writing with the uh, musician 50 Cent. Uh, then I worked on a book he wrote called Mastery. I was able to do marketing for some of his other books. It was a, a multi-year apprenticeship with my sort of dream writer. Um, it was, a, it was a, a journey through how, how books are made. And uh, then I went on, I became the director of marketing at a company called American Apparel, which was at the time one of the biggest fashion brands in the world. And then I started my own marketing company, which has now worked with companies like Google and Taser, uh, authors like Tim Ferriss and Tony Robbins. And uh, somewhere in between all this, at 25, I wrote my first book, which is an expose of the media system. Uh, that, that picture you saw that became a cover that's much cooler than I actually look, as you can tell. Um, and then I wrote two books uh, that I like to say are uh, feature Stoic philosophy. I, I don't pretend that they are works of Stoic philosophy. And these books have, uh, uh, you know, to my, to my surprise, have, have sold quite well and, and become popular in, in business uh, with a, a number of prominent CEOs, a uh, number of professional athletes, uh, college football coaches, college basketball coaches, and that's where I am today. I, I've just written a, a book that is a, an exploration of Stoicism. It is explicitly a work of Stoic philosophy with all new translations of what we call the big three. It's the, it's the first uh, work that, to feature uh, all three Stoics and then some of the lesser known Stoics in it as well. And actually, uh, we have copies for everyone in the back as a, as a thank you for coming and for supporting Stoicism. So they're going to put those out, and you can all take it. But that's my story. But if we back up a little bit, this is me at 19 years old. They're going to work on the light so it's a little darker. But uh, I was a bit chubbier at the time, as you can tell. But I was 19 years old, and I, I attended a conference, not unlike this one, for college journalists. And I met... Uh, um, a guy named Dr. Drew, who's a television personality, and I just asked him, I said, what book would you recommend that I read? And he told me I should check out the Stoics, which I did, uh, specifically Marcus Aurelius. Um, and actually, I have the Amazon receipt from my purchase, you can see here. Uh, I bought it on October 28th, 2006, so almost exactly 10 years ago. Amazon Prime did not exist at the time, so I had to buy these other two books to get, it, uh, to get free shipping. Uh, and then I had to wait several days for it to arrive. It finally did. And uh, this book was what the economist Tyler Cowen would call a quake book. It shook everything that I knew about the world. Uh, admittedly, at 19 years old, it wasn't a lot, but it still had that effect on me. And here are just some of the copies. Uh, again, you can't see this super well, but I have more or less torn them to shreds. Uh, here are some old copies that I have. Um, these are antique editions, rare books that, that I've been lucky enough to, to find in bookstores over the years. And then here is my now well-worn copy of Meditations, the Gregory Hayes translation, which uh, is starting to look not unlike these 100-year-old copies. And that's what I wanted to talk about today. Um, what, what have I learned in 10 years, um, a, a hundred or so reads, uh, a writer I like, he, he refers to this as center reading, um, hundred, uh, uh, 10 years and 100 reads of the same book, what are some lessons that's what I thought I would talk today about. Um, so this is my journey through Stoicism. So the first thing that I learned from Stoicism, the one quote that struck me most profoundly in the Hayes translation, which again, I, I love the most, um, it has, has come to define my understanding of Stoicism as a whole. And as you can see here, he's saying our actions uh, can be impeded, but there can be no impeding our intentions or dispositions because we can accommodate and adapt. The mind adapts and converts to its own purposes the obstacle to our acting, right? In short, the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. 
This is uh, where my book, The Obstacle is the Way, comes from. It's exclusively based on this idea, um, which if I had to summarize uh, Stoicism as a whole, I would say the Stoics believe we don't control what happens to us, we control how we respond, right? And uh, on top of that, the Stoics believe that in our response lay Stoic virtue, that any and every situation that we face, no matter how undesirable it may seem at first, it's an opportunity to practice virtue. And now, I think in this room, virtue is an exciting topic when I give talks to sports teams and companies. I usually, I usually um, I, I ask them to put a pin in the word virtue and I just say excellence, right? Every, every, every situation uh, we face is a chance for us to be our best, to be better than we otherwise would have been. And so to me, that's stoicism. That's what hit me like a ton of bricks at 19 years old. And that's what drove me on this journey to study. And so what I thought I would do then is just go through a few other lessons that I learned and then, and then we'll make it to Q&A. So, the first lesson, uh, I think the other thing that struck me so much as a, as a college student, and, a, and perhaps many of you can think back to this time in your life and relate, um, it's, it's, it's a particular quote. It's the quote from, from Marcus Aurelius that opens book five. Um, you know, he says, at dawn, when you have trouble getting out of bed, and then he proceeds to have a, a, a shockingly uh, modern dialogue with himself about wanting to stay under the covers and stay warm. Right? And he's urging himself to get out, to get out of bed because he has a job, because people are counting on him, um, because if he truly loved his work, he wouldn't struggle this way. And it's, it's amazing to me that 2,000 years ago, the most powerful man in the world, who if he, had, if he had wanted to, could have stayed in bed. He could have done business from his bed. He, never, he, never, he didn't have to leave, certainly. But, but here he is motivating himself. And, and as you can imagine, uh, you know, college students, we like to sleep in. We don't like to go to class. Um, I related to this, and, and again, I'm sorry you can't see this, but here's my copy of Meditations, and you can see I wrote fuck, double, uh, double underlined it, and wrote a giant arrow to precisely this meditation. So um, it's, it's interesting me, to me now that I can look back 10 years later and see how, um, because I kept my copy, I can see how specific passages impacted me at the time. So this had this, this profound impact on me. I actually printed this passage out and I taped it next to my bed uh, in my apartment in college, and it, this is the, the this is the I think my first um, introduction into philosophy as a very practical idea. Right? He's not, although he is talking about ethical ideas, and he's certainly talking about virtue and 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 selflessness and all these things. He's also just giving himself very practical advice. He's he's going through logic as Massimo is saying. He's he's created a logical case for why sleeping in is not allowed. Right, and I, I, that, that struck me as something very special and unique. Um, and then the next, uh, the next part of meditations that I, that I like and I think about the most and, and I think shape the course of my life is this idea of finding a master, right? And at one point in the meditations, Marcus says, go straight to the, street of in, uh, go straight to the, the seat of intelligence. And so to me, this, this is the idea of, uh, this is my copy again, the, this is having a mentor. Marcus in another passage, he says, um, uh, reading and writing requires a master, so too does life. And what he means by that is you can't learn these things on your own, you can't necessarily learn them from books. You have to apprentice under someone, you have to attach yourself to a master. Um, each one of the Stoics tended to have another Stoic who had introduced them to Stoicism that they cite over and over and over again, right? Um, in Marcus's case, it's interesting that, you know, he's, he as the emperor is quoting a, a slave whose notes he had gotten from his teacher, um, but so me attaching myself to, to mentors, it shapes the course of my life. Here's Robert, who even now it, it serves as a, as a sort of a, both a philosophical and a life role model for me. I'm, I'm working on a new project right now and I'm sort of just kicking it off. And you know, he called, uh, I called him this morning and we spoke um, to talk about this new project. So it's this idea of having people who are smarter than you, people who are better than you, people who are masters who are, who are um, you know, we were talking about virtue as being something you progress towards. Um, maybe someone who's just a little bit further on that path to you, that you're going straight to them and you're speaking with them, you're learning them, you're comparing yourself to them. Seneca also says, you know, without a ruler to measure yourself against, you can't make crooked straight. Um, and so this is this idea. How do you, how do you have people who, you, who, you, who are your masters, who are you looking up to? This is, this is a very stoic idea that I, that I take and it shapes the course of my life. Um, Seneca is also saying, you know, we're in the habit of saying that we, we can't choose our parents, right? And that's true, but he says we can choose whose children we would like to be. And so I think in one way or another, most of the people in this room have, have chosen 
uh, Stoicism as, uh, or the one or all of the Stoics as, as someone who, who, who maybe stands as a father figure to them, right? Um, and, and this is this idea that, that has stayed with me. Um, and of course, my, my favorite lesson about education and learning comes from Epictetus when he says, one cannot learn that which they think they already know. Um, and so part of attaching yourself to a master is inherently, uh, or, or it begins by admitting that, hey, other people know more than you, or you don't know everything that you think that you know. And I would say if you do think that you know everything there is to know, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You don't, you don't learn anymore. Um, Emerson, you know, he, he famously says, every man that I meet is my master in some form or another, and in that I learn from him. And of course, John Wheeler, the physicist, is saying, you know, the more we learn, the more it exposes us to what we don't know or what remains to be learned. Um, Socrates, of course, is wise because he knows what he doesn't know. And so this is this process of education that I take from the Stoics. I'm learning both from them, they're my masters in terms of moral and ethical and philosophical behavior, but also applying that lesson to the, the skills that I'm trying to learn as a professional, uh, you know, in becoming a writer. Who can I learn from? Who can show me the way? This is, this is a very Stoic model to me. Um, and then, you know, as a, as a, as a college student, and I, I think this is so common, it's almost become a cliche, um, you know, you, uh, many young men go away to college and, and, and the religion that they grew up with starts to collapse under the pressure of the intellectual journey that they're on, right? Maybe you read Richard Dawkins for the first time and you start to fool around with atheism. Um, you start to, to maybe realize that, hey, this, this sort of ethical or moral framework for understanding the world is not as complete or not as strong as you maybe would have thought of as a, as a teenager, as a child. That was certainly true for me. And I think what sh struck me about Stoicism and what has, has provided a lot of value in my life since then is this idea of, um, of, of being good and being moral and being virtuous um, for its own sake, right? Um, and not, not just for its own sake, um, but also because it, it improves your life as a whole. As Marcus is saying, the person who does wrong does wrong to themselves. The unjust person is unjust to themselves, right? So Christianity basically holds, hey, it, don't commit, th don't do this thing because it is a sin. Um, and they say, don't do sins because if you, if you sin, you go to hell. Now, the Stoics basically say, and my interpretation is, um, don't do a bad thing because it's also inflicting a bad thing onto you. They're, they're making a sort of a self-interested case for morality, right? Be a good person because uh, to be a bad person is a miserable way to live, right? And you think, I know we've joked a little bit about Donald Trump here today. I wouldn't trade places with Donald Trump, even if he becomes president, right? It's not, uh, even, even when you win, you lose in this way. And so this is something that I took uh, from the Stoics and, and stays with me till today. And then I, I also love from Marcus is one of, I think, his most quotable lines, you know, when he says, the best revenge is not to be like that. So these are, these are ideas that um, matter. They, they, I think they resonate. They're providing a framework that maybe one wouldn't have had early on in their life. Um, it's funny, I, I remember, uh, um, oh, here's my, here's my passage from Marcus, the best revenge not to be like that. Here's my notes. I remember very vividly reading the Stoics for the first time, and I was in the, the middle of this horrible fight with my, with my roommates. We were in this big argument. Some of us had screwed each other over, over money, and I was, I was upset about it. And um, I remember reading the Stoics for the first time and, and, and seeing, I wrote, here's their names right here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they, so, so I can look back and see, actually see the lessons that I was learning as I was learning them. You know, what, what um, I, I'm, I'm taking from this that, hey, um, it doesn't matter if this works for someone in the short term, you know, if, if screwing someone over works for them in the short term. It's a, it's a punishment in and of itself. You know, the, the, the best revenge is not to, to get even, it's to, to not be like that. It's to live your life under different terms. And so, Stoicism is also, you know, providing in some ways the, the, the role of a civic religion. And I, I think it's been that way historically over time as well. Um, the next thing I took from, Sto from the Stoics, I, I remember reading this passage. It's from Marcus Aurelius. I'm um, saying, you must build up your life action by action and be content if each one achieves its goal as far as possible and no one can keep you from this. I thought this was a really interesting idea, you know, at 19 or 20 or... Maybe I read it at 22 or 23 again. Um, I think I kind of got it, but there's a line from Plutarch where he's saying, you know, you don't learn from the words, you learn from your, from your experience and then the words. And, and it was uh, training in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu a few years later that I sort of figured out this, this process-oriented way of thinking, right, which is um, 
you know, you think you're in, a, in an untenable position. Uh, being in the full mount is probably the most difficult position in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Um, and, and I remember my, my instructor sort of just I, being overwhelmed. And the first thing he said is like, look, you don't make this worse. You got to maintain your emotions. Again, a very stoic idea. You don't panic. And then you break it apart in, in a set of uh, consecutive actions. And you only focus on, on getting that individual action out of the way, right? So first, you know, you get yourself some space. Maybe you pull a leg out. Um, you know, it's this, this process way of thinking is, so again, the Stoics are now resonating in my experience. And it, it wasn't until a few years later that I, I read an article about Nick Saban, who's the, the coach, um, the University of Alabama, maybe the greatest college football coach in history. And he's saying, look, it's not the end result. Don't think about the champ. Don't think about winning a championship. Um, don't think about any of these things. Just think about doing your job. Think about the smallest possible thing in front of you. One of the things that Nick Saban famously says is, you know, the average down in football lasts for seven seconds. Just focus on getting those seven seconds right. This is also a really uh, stoic idea. Um, and so it sort of all came, uh, came full circle when, uh, Nick Saban is talking about Marcus Aurelius on ESPN a few months ago. I was lucky enough to go and speak to the team. Um, and, and the idea that 2,000 years uh, separate these two men, and they're both thinking about the same process, um, that, that not getting ahead of yourself, not extrapolating all the way to the end, but staying very much in the moment, focusing on doing your job in that moment, doing the right thing in that moment, and being, as the Stoics would say, indifferent to the ultimate outcome. Right? Um, and it's, it, it's interesting when you watch Nick Saban, he'll often be most dissatisfied when the team loses, or sorry, when the team wins um, versus when they lose because he's focused not on what that game means, not on the score, but on whether they did the right thing in those given moments. And we'll talk a little bit about that more. Um, now, more practically, I think what I've taken from Stoicism, uh, you know, people, uh, the, the famous criticism of Stoicism, of course, is that it's depressing, that it's boring, that it's relentlessly negative. I actually find the opposite. I find Stoicism to be very inspiring, um, very uh, captivating, very intriguing. It, it, it makes me marvel at the wonder of the world. And Marcus Aurelius is saying this here. He's saying, watch the stars in their courses and imagine running alongside them. Think constantly on the changes of the elements into each other, for such thoughts wash away the dust of earthly life. And so uh, that's a very beautiful sentiment, right? So I actually don't think Marcus Aurelius is a pessimist. I don't think the Senate, the, that the Stoics are negative. I actually think they find beauty in, the, in, in both the beauty of the world and they also find it in the mundane, right? Marcus is writing about, you know, finding the flecks of foam on a boar's mouth or the, the furrowed brow of the lion. He's finding beauty in these everyday things. And this is washing away the, the petty concerns of life. Now, um, one of the stories that I tell in one of my books that I love that I think is an example of this is John Muir, he goes to Glacier Bay in Alaska in 1873, I believe. Um, you can't really tell from this photo. It looks pretty amazing, um, but then you look at what it looks like now, you can get why he would have this reaction. He writes as a very long quote, so I won't repeat it. But in this moment, he's not only reflecting on the beauty of what he's seeing, but on the interconnectedness of all these things. The way that everything seems to be in sympathy with each other, in sync with each other, um, and, and how humans are a part of this larger ecosystem. And, and this is both a humbling idea and an inspiring idea, as we'll find. Um, and so I try to seek out these moments as the practice of my stoicism, right? This is a photo I took in Sedona a few weeks ago. This is my donkey in Austin. Um, that purple sunset behind it is something they call in Austin, uh, Austin O'Henry called Austin the city with a violent, uh, with a violet crown. Um, it's just, you're, you're finding the beauty in everyday life, and I, ideally beauty that is so beyond our comprehension, so large that it, that it humbles you. This is what Hado calls the, the oceanic feeling, right? Seeking this out, um, finding your place among the immensity. Um, Here's a, a, a Latin inscription from Seneca, which I love. Um, you know, he's saying, the world itself is a huge temple of all the gods. And find it, seeing the world around you as this temple that, you are, that, you are, uh, um, that you're essentially praying and that you're praying in with your life. Um, here's, a, here's a photo I took last week. You can't see it again, I'm sorry. But this is a, this is a dinosaur footprint in a riverbed in, uh, right outside Dallas, Texas. And actually, Massimo talks about it a little bit in his book on why people believe in bunk science. A lot of creationists have tried to argue that these aren't real or that actually humans walked al alongside these footprints, which of course they didn't. But it was amazing to me to be able to stand in something that another animal had stood in 100 plus million years ago and feel that continuity. This is where, again, the, the, 
the, earth, the, the dust of earthly concerns go away. Here's me also reading uh, meditations on the Appian Way in Rome, not far from Seneca's tomb, right? To think of the thousands of, and millions of people uh, throughout history who've gone up and down this road and what has happened to them and how they've disappeared, like, like we in turn will disappear. Um, I, I took this picture in, um, in Trafalgar Square in London. Um, an, an interesting anecdote, I think, is the idea that as they excavated the earth around Nelson's column to lay the foundation for these, these lions, they found the bones of prehistoric lions that had roamed in the exact same spot tens of thousands of years earlier. Um, on Reddit, I, again, I, I try to seek out these sort of humbling little anecdotes. Um, some historians on Reddit did the math, and based on verifiable accounts, they wanted to see how many people shook hands with each other to connect Barack Obama with George Washington. And the answer is six. Six individuals who lived at the same time, touching hands with each other, connecting over the entire course of American history. Um, this is another one, again, a little blurry. There's a game show that it, this, this particular episode aired in 1956. An old man is on the show. It's called I've Got a Secret. Uh, the other guest on the show is Lucille Ball. Guessing his secret, um, as he begins to give clues, his secret turns out to be uh, that he, was, he saw John Wilkes Booth assassinate Abraham Lincoln. Um, and so this idea that um, you know, a century uh, this man's life is spanning a century. He's on modern television with the star of I Love Lucy talking about something that we think is in the distant past. And this is a theme you see the Stoics talk about a lot, right? He's saying, think by way of example on the times of Vespasian and you'll see all these things, marrying, raising children, falling ill, dying, wars, holiday feasts, commerce, farming. And he lists and, and he's saying, he, he wants us to think about the timeless rhythm of events the way that we'll all succumb to them, the way that, the world, that we're also all a part of them. And, and this stoic idea, this, this, this idea that, that we're in sympathy with the universe, that there's something larger than us going on, is, is probably one of my favorite themes in all of stoicism. Um, you can see this is one of my copies, and I, I wrote a reminder to myself at the time. You know, I'm, I'm an ambitious uh, young person. I, at, at some later date, I wrote this, and you know, he's saying, don't let yourself forget how many doctors have died furrowing their brows over how many deathbeds. And, you know, I, I wanted to remind myself of plotters and schemers and strategists outsmarted, outmaneuvered, and destroyed. I'm, I'm talking to myself here, essentially, right? That you, you might think that you're, you know, um, hot shit. You might think that you're amazing. Uh, you might think that you're going places. You might think that you're making a dent in the world. And, and the reality is that the, Sto that the Stoics remind us over and over again so these things don't go to our head is that that's not the case. And if you, if you, if you zoom out a little bit, if you take uh, Plato's view, as they call it, um, you, you're able to see these things in their proper perspective. Um, and, and, and it's not solely, though, to break you down. It's also to build you up. As Neil deGrasse Tyson is talking, to go back to this cosmos idea, um, when you look up at the universe, you feel small, but you also feel big because you know that you're a part of it. You know that you're, although a small part, you're a part of this larger idea, and so I love that. Um, to go back to the negative side of things, I do think the Stoics are great at knocking down the ego, reminding of us our true place in the world. Even you know, Marcus Aurelius, the most powerful man in the world at that time, is, is wanting to remind himself not to think that he's too important or that, that he'll even be remembered by history. Um, I love what, what I think I would call contemptuous expressions. It's probably my favorite Stoic exercise, right? Because again, these are not thoughts. These are things you're supposed to do. You're supposed to remind yourself. So I gave a talk earlier this week at the 92nd Street Y. It was sort of always a bucket list thing for me. I thought it was, you know, I mean, this big fancy event that, you know, would never happen to someone like me. Um, when I looked at the other speakers who were speaking that week, it was pretty absurd, right? Trevor Noah, Tony Bennett and Gail King were speaking, Alexander Wang. Um, it's crazy, right? And then what you remind yourself is actually these, these big unattainable things are not only attainable, they're much less impressive than you, know, you might want to make them seem. Uh, there's a great uh, quote from Marcus Aurelius where he's doing this. He's saying, like seeing roasted meat and other, um, and other dishes in front of you and suddenly realizing this is a dead fish, right? That wine is just fermented grapes, um, that, that this is a dead pig, a dead bird, um, that he even reminds himself that the cloak of the emperor, he's the only one allowed to wear purple, that this is just regular cloth dyed with shellfish blood. He also says famously, right, that uh, sex is just the rubbing of skin and then an explosion. Um, he, he's, he's, he's not, he obviously, sex feels good to him. Obviously, food tastes good to him. He's a human being, but he's reminding himself on the other end, he's being sort of cynical on purpose so these things lose their power over him. 
Louis C.K. is doing the same thing. This is what I remind myself as I was speaking at the Y, right? You know, he's saying, you know, you think you get these calligraphy written envelopes anointing you to some special opportunity, um, but in fact, he's saying Carnegie Hall is just a place you rent, and in fact, it's not even the best place to rent. The Beacon Theater is better, right? Um, this audience is actually much better than the audience at the Y, right? And uh, so it's this idea of breaking things down so they lose their sway over you, which is what Marcus says, right? Perceptions like that, latching onto things and piercing through them. I think that's what this exercise is about. So we can see what they really are. That's what we need to do all the time, all through our lives when things lay claim to our trust, to lay them bare and see how pointless they are to strip away the legend that encrusts them. Again, I don't think Marcus was celibate. Clearly he wasn't or he wouldn't have had a child. Um, you know, I don't think he, he, he didn't not eat the food that they put out for him. Seneca most famously clearly enjoyed the finer things in life. But it's also going through these exercises, the thing that you strive for, that you yearn for, um, the things that you love, the things that you cherish, it's also reminding yourself at the end of the day that they're just stuff and stripping away that legend that encrusts them. This is how um, you don't become addicted to the things that you have. And then when fate potentially takes them away from you, you're able to survive and persevere through that. Um, the other thing I've had to learn as a, as a writer and as an entrepreneur and as a creative is that, look, at a certain point, everything that you do, it leaves your hands. And you're gonna have to become okay with that fact. And this is where the stoic idea of indifference to the externals, um, focusing on what you control versus you don't, what you don't control. Um, Marcus is saying, I'm constantly amazed by how easily we love ourselves all, uh, above all others, yet we, pour, we put more stock in their opinions about us than our own. And I remember reading this as a young man, um, and then uh, when The Obstacle is the Way came out, and then again with, with Ego, um, you know, I told myself that I'd written a great book, that I was putting it out in the world, that I was proud of it, um, that if no one read it, I'd be happy. Um, and you know, the books ended up selling more copies than I thought. And, and a lot of authors do a number of manipulative things to make sure they hit the bestseller list. Sometimes they buy lots of copies of their own book, or you know, they, they do various things to, to get this sort of socially significant uh, marker. And I told myself I wasn't gonna do those things, that that opinion didn't matter to me. Um, and then uh, through, uh, through you know, luck and good fortune and, and hard work, my book sold enough copies, uh, both with The Obstacle is the Way and with Ego, to, to to properly debut on the New York Times bestseller list. So I remember very vividly um, with, uh, with Ego, which came out just a few months ago. You know, first I got the number from the publisher of how many copies I sold, and it was more than twice what I thought that I would sell. And I was very ecstatic. Um, you know, hey, this is great. Uh, people are liking it. It's going, it's going along. This is, although I was already happy, this is success. And then just a few minutes later, I got the news that it wasn't on the New York Times bestseller list, although it should have been. It should have been at number four or six on the list, I forget, right? So here is, here is this test, and, and I'll be honest with you, I think I failed that test. The, the immediately, disappointment is what, what hits you. you. You think, why did they take this from me? Why don't I have it? Why am I not happy? You know, the, this, these external judgments, they have power over us. And there's, this, uh, there's an email I have here from my publisher where they're sort of explaining why this might have happened, our theory of what might have happened. There's a categorization error for the Wall Street Journal list, um, and then uh, for the New York Times list, it's, it remains a, a mystery. But this is, again, why you can't put stock in these external things that you don't control. As a, as a creative, um, what the critics think of your work, what the audience thinks of your work, what uh, gatekeepers or lists or uh, you know, uh, curators think of your work, these are the things that are outside of your control, and you have to remind yourself of that. And, and as a creative, if you go into what you're doing and you say, I'm only gonna be happy if this external thing happens, right? I'm only gonna be happy if, if it's published by this publisher, if I'm only gonna be happy if it wins this award, it's only gonna be happy if I make this amount of money. These are recipes for misery because you've now put your happiness in the hands of someone else, someone who is indifferent to you, someone you don't control. Um, as Robert Louis Stevenson, it, says in an essay that he wrote about Alexander the Great and Diogenes uh, famously meeting, um, you know, he says, it is a sore thing to have labored along and scaled arduous hilltops, and when all is done, find humanity indifferent to your achievement. And this is true, and this is real. One of my favorite writers is John Kennedy Toole. Uh, he writes this brilliant work. Uh, it's rejected by publishers. He commits suicide over the rejection. Um, and then his mother finds it, a few years later and it's published, and the year it's published, it wins the Pulitzer Prize. 
The work doesn't change, right? The work that someone said was worthless and shouldn't have been published, um, and the work that ultimately wins the highest honor for a, for a work of humor, um, it's the exact same work. And this is why putting your faith in these externals, as the Stoics would say, is such a bad idea. Um, as Mark, uh, John Wooden I love, he says, you know, success is peace of mind for knowing that you made the best effort, right? I can be happy with the books that I write, but I can't put my happiness then in what other people say or do. And that leads me to one of my favorite quotes from Marcus. You know, he says, ambition means tying your well-being to what other people say or do. Self-indulgence means tying it to what happens to you and then, of course, sanity, where I would say, you know, stoic wisdom is in tying it to your own actions, right? And so this is a lesson, I think, for anyone who puts work out into the world, anyone who does anything. You know, you could slave away on, on a project for years and, you know, you hit the launch button and at that moment it is no longer outside your control. And so this distinction between what we control and what we do not control at the, at the basis of stoicism is incredibly relevant even two or 3,000 years later. Now, I, I've got two quick stories left, and then we'll do questions. But, you know, I told you that the first thing that hit me about Stoicism was this idea of, look, you've got to get, get out of bed, get off your ass, and get moving. And that was a lesson that I very much needed at 19 years old. Um, but what I think is so amazing about the Stoics is that every time you read them, as you change, they change, right? Heraclitus says, no man steps in the same river twice because... It is not the same river and he is not the same man. I think that's true for the Stoics as well, right? When I, what I read, the first time I read Marcus Aurelius um, versus when I read it, you know, just a few days ago to prepare for this talk, I'm a different person and, and in some ways the world around me is also different. And so um, what I take from it now, what strikes me the most is, is this quote from Marcus Aurelius, right? If you seek tranquility, do less. So on the one hand, Marcus Aurelius is... is driving me to be more active, to be more ambitious, and I think that served me well, and maybe I took it too far. Um, you know, I, I, I opened Ego the, Ego is the Enemy with a little bit of discussion of my own sort of struggles with work addiction and, and overcommitment and compulsive behavior. Um, and, and what I take from the Stoics now is, is the same sort of wisdom and insight and, and new ways of thinking to help me do less, right? To help me be more disciplined in, in finding leisure and, and relaxation and stillness. Um, Here's a, a quote now that I have on my wall. It's not from the Stoics, but I think the Stoics would agree to it. I love the, the interplay between, or the, the, the overlap between Stoicism and Buddhism. You know, Zhang Zhao is saying, um, you know, peace is in the emptiness. Emptiness is in the fast of the mind. What about when you have nothing, when you have clarity and emptiness, when you're existing solely in the present moment? This is also the beauty of Stoicism. It's for the active man um, who's able to find peace even in the, in the middle of the agora or, or in the senate or in the forum. We're able to find peace and stillness in everything that we do. Um, and so here's another passage. Again, I'm, I apologize you can't see everything, um, but maybe the video feed will pick it up better. But, you know, Marcus is saying, constantly run down the list of all of those who have felt intense anger at something the most famous, the most uh, unfortunate, you know, the most active, and ask, what is all that now? He's saying smoke, air, dust. Um, and I'm saying to myself, you know, you can be the most driven person in the world, but you're still going to die, right? You're still subject to the, the normal human limits. And this, this is what, so the Stoics are reminding us of, of all these things and how wherever you approach them in your life, they're going to teach and give you something different. And then the final lesson I wanted to give you, and maybe this can lead into our discussion a little bit, is what is the role of philosophy? I think the Stoics uh, you know, I remember I was taking a course called Honors Philosophy 101 at, at, in college as I picked up the Stoics at the same time, and I was struck by their radical def difference in definitions of, of philosophy from my university professor versus Marcus Aurelius. As Marcus is saying, it stares you right in the face. No role is so well suited to philosophy as the one you happen to be in right now. Now, it strikes me, um, ha having thought about this, you know, is he saying that no role is so well suited to philosophy as, as the emperor, as the president? Is this a statement about being a philosopher king? Or is he saying any role? I think it's probably both. I think we can interpret it in both ways. Any and every role, no matter how big or small, um, is well suited to philosophy. It's interesting to think, you know, you have Epictetus, a slave, on the one hand, extreme powerlessness. You have Marcus Aurelius on the other, um, extreme power. You have maybe Seneca in the middle, who's both sort of a prisoner and a practitioner of power. Um, and, and that philosophy is, is for life, 
right, as, as Jules famously said, and I think is, is, is well said. Um, you know, the Stoics love Cato, and what's interesting is that Cato didn't write any philosophical works. He was a philosopher because of how he lived his life, what he did. His actions were the philosophy that he was writing into the historical record. Um, and I think Socrates as well, right? Um, Socrates survives to us in dialogues that other people wrote down. Philosophy for him was, was walking around and asking provocative questions, questions that mostly ended in people hating him. But nevertheless, right, he's a philosopher for, how, for what he does and how he lives his life, not as a philosopher as in the academic setting. And, and I love this about Stoicism. It's a, it's a reminder that it doesn't matter what your educational background is. It doesn't matter if you're a janitor or a senator. Um, Stoicism is there for you to use, and you can push this, this practice forward with your actions, not just your words. It doesn't matter if you have a platform or you do have a platform. Um, Seneca uh, says this in, 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 in the Daily Stoic, which is back there. You'll see the epigraph for the book, and I, I just love this line. Of all people, only those are at leisure who make time for wisdom. Only they truly live. Um, philosophy is, is not just a great way to live life. It is a way to fully capture and, 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 and experience life. Um, otherwise, we're just sort of operating. You know, we're, maybe you could say we're in Plato's cave. Um, we're... we're, we're ignorant and we're not even aware of the intensity of our ignorance and, and that this is what philosophy is about. And I think this is what empowered me and inspired me as a writer and as a human being that I, that I read about Stoicism. And I think historically this has also been true. Epicurus is saying, and I know there's little Epicurean Stoicism rivalry, but Seneca liked to say, like, I'll quote a bad author if the line is good. Um, Seneca says, vain, or Epicurus says, vain is the word of philosopher which does not heal the suffering of man. Thoreau is saying, to be a philosopher is not merely to have subtle thoughts or to found a school, but to solve some of the practical problems of life, uh, not only theoretically, but practically. And I think that's well said, and I think that's why all of us are here. Um, and this, this goes to what I thought we might discuss a little bit, and, and Donald uh, posted this on our Stoicism on Reddit, which I think is great, and I think it's a good question. You know, he's asking, is Stoicism becoming too trendy? Um, and I think it's a good question, but I, I, would, I would sort of push back on that. Um, I think Stoicism is philosophy designed for the masses, um, that, it, that if it needs to be simplified so the masses can, can find an entry point into it, um, so be it, right? And so when Sports Illustrated wrote a, book about, uh, a piece about my book, how it was spreading through the NFL, some people didn't like that, and they thought you know, that perhaps this was a perversion of philosophy, although I would argue um, that if Seneca was alive today, he'd probably be watching uh, American football, the same way that he clearly watched uh, Roman chariot racing, uh, and, and, and that's why we have so many colorful analogies and examples from him. The Stoics also loved wrestling. So this idea that you know, Stoicism is for certain people and not for other people, I, I sort of wholeheartedly reject, and I think that, that that way of thinking actually prevents this room from being 1,000 people or 2,000 people and sticks it at 350 or 300. I think. Um, on whatever terms we can reach people, uh, the better, right? Marcus says, don't go expecting Plato's Republic. Um, that means don't go expecting perfectly informed lovers of wisdom. Some people, what they want from philosophy are the practical benefits. And I think they'll see over time that there are also hu humanitarian and personal and, and, and ethical benefits as well. Um, here's Carrie, uh, Carrie, Walsh, the, uh, Carrie Walsh Jennings, the Olympic champion, right? To me, that's amazing that a four-time Olympic champion is talking about Stoicism and putting it in front of millions of people. This is amazing. This is good for us. Um, and, and so I, I just want to urge everyone um, to, to remember that not everyone out there loves philosophy for its own sake the way that we do. They are, I, I, as I thought about when I was writing The Obstacle is the Way, you know, most people do not wake up and think, I need philosophy. They wake up and they say, I have problems and I need solutions. And to me, philosophy is a solution to that problem. But if philosophy to them you know, evokes the turtlenecked college professor using big words that they don't understand, well then let's make it easier for them and let's approach them where they are and let's reach and interact with them where they are and let's make this as big a tent as possible. Um, so that's why we wrote The Daily Stoic. We're honored to share it all with you. And I'm happy to answer any and every questions that you guys have. So thank you for having me. Thanks, Ryan. So we'll open to the question in a second. I have one more announcement to make. As I said, I'm going to make it now because you're not going to listen later. 
Uh, if people are interested, there is a follow-up to Stoicon tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock at 60 Wall Street. It's the atrium in Wall Street. Greg will lead a Stoic, there's, that's Greg right there, uh, a Stoic-themed uh, walk through New York and Brooklyn. We're going to see Seneca's grave, epic, no. Um, <laughs> we're going to do all sorts of interesting th things and practicing and talking and practicing stories tomorrow at 2 o'clock in the afternoon if you guys are interested. Also, I already reminded you, the Facebook, the Stoikon Facebook page has a place where people can actually virtually go there and organize social groups for tonight, for drinking, eating, whatever you want to do tonight. It's none of my business. Um, and the reception will open basically when we're done here with the q and I will need to get you out of here immediately, but the reception is, is open. And if you have a ticket, you can go, get in immediately. If you don't have a ticket, wait until about 6.35, 6.40. You might still be able to get in. All of the speakers will be there to talk to you. Ryan can take questions. I feel, Greg, I feel like instead of starting on Wall Street, you should start at the Marcus Aurelius plaque on Library Walk. Um, all right, who wants to go first? Uh, go for it. Just say the question to me and then I'll repeat it. My personal weakness, so are you asking what are my personal weaknesses and how does stoicism help me? Um, I, I think the, the, what I was talking about, about tranquility, about doing less, is probably the thing that I struggle with and I think about most. Um, how can I make sure that I'm not uh, overactive, that I'm not doing things for the sake of doing them, that I don't get too attached to these external outcomes? Uh, uh, you know, Marx really has this quote where he says, you know, a rock gains nothing by going up and loses nothing by coming down. I think that's a, to me, that's a reminder that, you know, these things we strive for and hope for, they're great. But if you become too attached to these outcomes, if you think that the world depends on this happening, um, that's a recipe for unhappiness because the ultimate outcome is in some ways outside of your control. Go for it. Uh, he asked, if I could ask my favorite philosopher a question, what would I ask him? Um, I, you know, I've never thought about that. That's a good question. Um, I think it would be interesting um, that one of the things that strikes me about meditation specifically is that people have deduced from it that maybe Marcus Aurelius wasn't a happy person, that he didn't experience much joy, that he's pretty dour. You know, he talks about death a lot. My interpretation of, of it is that he was only writing things that he personally needed help with. So he didn't need to write, you know, in book six, like, hey, uh, remember to laugh at funny jokes or, you know. He, he wasn't reminding himself, hey, sex uh, feels good, make sure to do it, right? He was reminding himself, hey, don't chase this pleasure too much. But I, w I would love to sort of know, the elephant in the room is, was he a happy person? We can't, we can't th there's no evidence of this. So did he enjoy his life? You know, uh, what, it, what, what were his favorite things? You know, and then I guess if I was really putting on my sort of journalistic historical fact, I, I would want to know what went, what went so wrong with Commodus. Um, I think that would be pretty interesting as well. Yes, go for it. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the perks about being a writer is that my practice and my life are somewhat connected, right? So um, if I didn't get to write about these things and publish them or, you know, work for two years on a book thinking about these ideas, I'd have to, I'd have to carve out special time to do that. Um, but I do journal every morning. You know, Massimo has, has talked about his sort of morning practice. I think I've incorporated some of that into my own life. You know, I write in a journal every morning. Before I sit down to write my work writing, I write in, in a journal, you know, what I'm, what I'm pleased with about the day that just happened, what I can do better, um, what I did right, um, and what I'm thinking about the day to come. So I, I like that. I do that reflection before I get started and also a review of the day to come. I think that's really important. Um, but I, I think it's important to remember that this, the Stoics, uh, you know, the reason Marcus and Seneca and these other Stoics repeat themselves so much is that that's, that is, like, it's called meditations. He's meditating on these themes. So they're not being repetitive, they're doing the work. And so I think it's important that you don't go, oh yeah, I've read Marcus Aurelius, or oh, I've read Seneca. It's not a one and done thing. It's a, it's a lifetime interaction. So that's where I get them. That's a big part of my practice is just reviewing and interacting with this material. Uh, yeah, go for it. Mm-hmm. 
Sure. Do you think the philosophy loses anything if people take an a good? Well, I, I, again, to me, what the obs- he, he was asking, some of the successful people that I talk about in my books were not the most virtuous of people, you know, John D. Rockefeller or Samuel Zamuri. Um, you know, I, you could also argue, you know, Marcus Aurelius was a, a dictator, basically, right? Uh, he executed people. You know, Seneca was Nero's tutor, um, not the greatest pupil in the world. Um, but, you know, my book is the stories are illustrating specific Stoic themes. So I'm not saying be like John D. Rockefeller and ruthlessly destroy your enemies. I'm saying be like John D. Rockefeller in his uh, self-mastery of his emotions and his ability to, to see things objectively and to find opportunities in adversity. And so I, I, I'm just saying to look at that specific part. I'm not saying take an a la carte view of Stoicism, although I would imagine almost everyone in this room takes an a la carte version of Stoicism uh, in that I would say most of us probably reject predetermination. Uh, maybe I'm projecting, but I would say most people don't think they're, that most people believe in free will. Um, but, you know, Plutarch, uh, most people, you know, sort of ascribe a a belief in Stoicism to him, but he's also a biographer. When he's writing about Alexander the Great, he's liking some things about this person and condemning other things. Um, The book is designed to be inspiring, so I don't want to go off in the weeds and talk about, you know, how Johnny Rockefeller polluted certain things, you know, that is, you know, his refineries polluted a river, that's not the point that I'm making. But I, I, I don't deny that that exists, so... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to illustrate specific themes through stories. I'm not making endorsements about specific people. You know, Steve Jobs' uh, desire for control and his ruthlessness doesn't contradict the wisdom of the Buddhist teachings that he also believed. Uh, go for it. Yeah, a lot of white guys in here. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just saying it's, it's, even, it's probably even less diverse in that sense. I don't know. Uh, I really don't know. Um, I, I do know that I've, I found my audience to be pretty diverse. I've found, you know, I've gotten emails from every person, every uh, gender, every socioeconomic quarter. I, I, I've, I've tended to find that. Um, you know, it's, it's been interesting. I think my book is on its fifth printing in India, which I would not have expected. Um, so I think Stoicism is more diverse than perhaps it looks, but I do find... Um, you know, Wikipedia uh, has a similar problem where I think some of the most active participants maybe scare away or are intimidate some of the other participants who would like to participate in the community. So I would say, you know, who knows why it's currently not diverse, but to get those people to come into the tent, we have to be uh, less judgmental. We have to not bombard people when they come in. Um, and we have to, again, meet people where they are. Um, Go for it. Uh, so he, he's asking about uh, weaknesses in Stoicism that I might see. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have any strong opinions. I think um, I, I tend to find that. St- I'll say one of the problems that I found in sort of introducing the sto- Stoicism to people is that it's been hard historically to say where to start, right? Um, you know, I love Marcus Aurelius, but it was just a chance, like, you know, I bought Epictetus at the same time and it came later. And so I just, I got lucky that Marcus Aurelius was the right Stoic for me to start with. Um, it's, he's not the right one for everyone. So I think one of the problems that we've, we've had is, is where to start, what's the best introductory text? I think that's one problem more on a, a, a larger scale. I, I do think the, the focus on negativity inside Stoicism deters people who, who don't understand that they're doing that to be more optimistic and resilient over the long term. So I, I guess, um, you know, I, 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 fi- I find that that holds people back. People think that it's negative and depressing. Of course, the word Stoic uh, has been so perverted in the English language that I think it de- deters a lot of people as well. Um, 
Um, so he said that I'm a, a popular living or a popular uh, Stoic writer, uh, and, and is there was Stoic, Stoicism become more popular? Are, obviously, I'm popular in terms of living spokespeople. The, the, the classic original texts still sell lots, and, and they do well. But um, I think uh, it's, it's interesting. I was, I was talking to someone in the hall about this. You know, a book like The Secret, which is total bullshit, has sold millions of copies, right? Ten, actually, tens of millions of copies. Um, so my books are a tiny, you know, a tiny fraction of, of the sales of just one singular self-help book. So the genre is enormous, and the appetite for learning and, and improvement is also enormous. So I would say we're, you know, one-tenth of one percent of the way where we could potentially be like a word like mindfulness and some of the Eastern philosophy that's become much more popular. It does strike me as odd that we see this resurgence of Eastern philosophy when we live in the Western world, and that the Stoics, the, we have much more in common with the Roman Stoics than I think we do a, you know, a Buddhist monk or a Confucian thinker. I think our lifestyles and what we prioritize and the capitalist system that we live in. Stoicism is, is again, it's for the man in the marketplace. I, I tend to find Buddhism works really well if you're meditating in a temple in beautiful green hills or something, and it's less practical if you're working at a large company or, you know, you know, a professional athlete or something. So I, I think there's a long way to go, and I think we've only captured maybe a, a very small percentage of, of the potential market of people who have problems, and those problems could be solved by some of the, the insights. I mean, stoicism helps you with stress. It helps you with, you know, desires, managing your temper, all the things that universal human principles stoicism helps with. And so I think there's a long way to go. Yeah. Yeah, she asked, what's the most popular idea or thing maybe I get the best reaction from when I talk about stoicism? I would say that that idea, we don't control what happens to us, we control how we respond. That's an idea that a lot of people know intuitively, but hearing it expressed in simple language, you know, I get a lot of nodding, nodding of the head. You know, I find for the most part, stoicism is very common sense. I'm a, I've, I'll give you an example. I found with um, uh, professional sports coaches and college coaches, they have a really great intuitive understanding of how all these things work because um, they've done it for so long. They've, they've worked with so many young men and women um, and they've seen where people have failed and where the, what, why people have succeeded. They have a good intuitive understanding of this. Um, they just don't understand necessarily the scientific principles or the philosophical or historical lessons behind those things that would allow them to articulate it more easily. So, you know, I get a lot of people that come up to me and they be like, you know, my grandmother told me something very similar. So I think a lot of Stoicism is very common sense. You know, you could argue that Christianity has absorbed a lot of Stoic principles, so a lot of people are somewhat familiar or vaguely familiar with the ideas. But I think at, I would say, you know, we don't control what happens to us, we control how we respond, is number one. Number two would be, you know, there is no good or bad, there's only perception. As, as uh, Shakespeare says, you know, nothing, neither good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. I think those are two of the most powerful ideas and probably the two best entry points into a philosophy. Yeah. Uh, so earlier in your presentation, you mentioned finding a master and becoming a student. Yes. Um, so throughout the entire presentation, you know, we, we, we kind of became students of the civil philosophy of simple learning. Um, did Aurelius propose that saying that we should become students to Mm -hmm. or, or could be more interpreted as looking at uh, successful great people like Winston Churchill, yeah. Frieden, Theodore Roosevelt, throughout history, and taking their writings and applying that to our life. Yeah, so he, he's asking you know, about this idea of finding a master. Does the master have to be alive? Um, I would say absolutely not. Um, and in fact, you see this. I, I don't think, I don't totally know, but I... Epictetus would have, been, would have died by the time Marcus Aurelius had found his work, almost certainly, right? Um, and, and certainly Socrates is dead. So certainly they're, they're drawing from past people, right? The, the Stoic tradition is quoting the great masters and repeating their words and adding to them. Um, so, so absolutely, you should draw from the great men and women of history. You know, Seneca is saying, find yourself a Cato. Um, and, and it's the same idea. Um, you know, find someone who you can model your behavior against. Um, and I don't think they need to be living. It's great if they're living because you can call them up and ask them, right, and say, hey, what should I do or what would you do in this situation? Um, or maybe it's a little bit fresher in your memory, but I, th I think, you know, when he's saying you can find out whose children you want to be, 
you know, it's, it's, a, it's an intellectual exercise. You're not literally being adopted by them the way that, you know, um, Marcus Aurelius is adopted or, 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 or whatever. In the back? Yes. Yeah, so he's asking, how do you balance seeking tranquility uh, with, with pushing yourself and fulfilling your potential? Um, well, I think the, there's a wonderful book. It's not about Stoic, Stoic philosophy, but uh, it's by a guy named Greg McCowan. It's called Essentialism. And so I think what the Stoics are talking about is not that you shouldn't be active, you shouldn't do things, but you should focus on what is essential. You know, it's prioritization. It's not chasing everything in front of you. It's not, you know, relentlessly striving for an, an, in, an infinite amount of things, but it's knowing what you're trying to do and what's important to you and focusing your energy on that. So, you know, as you become successful, you are presented with more and more opportunities and, and you know, and that can become somewhat addicting and it becomes hard to, to say no to things. I think the, the Stoics have a lot of great advice on, you know, saying no to what is unassent. You know, Marcus is saying in one meditation, you know, be okay with being thought a fool about certain, ma certain trivial matters. To me, I translate that as, hey, don't watch the news so much, right? You don't need to know the intricacies of every social issue, every breaking news story, or every hot piece of gossip. Focus on what you're really trying to do, and then you can be tranquil and uh, strive to do things at the same time. Uh, Sure. Um, so he's, he's asking about finding mentors and masters and what if they disappoint you or, you know, how, how do you know what to emulate and what not to emulate? Obviously, I think this is a personal thing at some level. I wouldn't say that my mentors, certain people have disappointed me, just turned out to be more complicated than maybe I thought or that I think like all of us, they have a good qualities and bad qualities and sometimes those bad qualities can overwhelm the positive, uh, the po the positive ones. Um, I try, I think Stoicism is fundamentally about not judging other people but focusing on yourself. So that's something I certainly took from that. Not projecting onto other people certain expectations because you don't control them. So I, 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 try, I try to remind myself when I'm disappointed in someone that they didn't disappoint me. I projected something onto them and they didn't live up to that. That's not their fault, that's my fault. Um, but uh, I think it's remembering that, you know, everyone is complicated and nuanced and you know if you look too hard at Seneca you know uh, like Eric Rahm's book Dying Every Day you know you look too hard at some of these people they're they're not as great as maybe they they might look at a first glance and and so you got to remember that you know um, we're, we're all good and bad and it's that struggle towards you know the good outweighing the bad that makes us ultimately who we are and, I, and so I guess I am in favor of picking and choosing um, you pick the good stuff and you leave the bad stuff for them to sort out. Uh, go for it. What are problem areas in my life where Stoicism has fallen short for me? Um, it's a good question. Uh, I, I, I can't think of a moment where, you know, it really let me down. I think, you know, there's that, that famous story about... Um, uh, you know, a wise king asking his, you know, trusted advisors to find a, a sentence that's true in every situation, and, you know, they come up with, and this too shall pass. Um, I think a lot of the maxims, maxims of Stoicism are like that. You know, they're true in basically any and all situations. Um, you know, you don't control what happens to you, you control how you respond. I've yet to encounter a situation where that's not the case. Um, you know, maybe, you know, the Stoics did coming in a time before our, an understanding of, you know, uh, psychology and, um, and, 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 and mental illness, uh, you know, maybe, you know, when they say you control your thoughts, is that true if you have a disorder or, you know, you have a tumor pressing on your brain? Um, probably not. Thankfully, you know, that I don't have one of those that I know of. Uh, so, 
But, but I do wonder in some of those extreme situations, would it hold up? Um, and I would say it's much more likely that you have trouble, you have trouble holding up to the principal versus the principal failing, failing you. It's easy to say, you know, they can throw me in chains, but my mind will be on philosophy. It's pretty fucking hard to actually do that. That's a good way to All right. Thanks, man. <laughs>